Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us on Westlife Development Limited earnings conference call for the quarter ended 30th June 2021. We are joined here today by Mr. Amit Jatia, Vice Chairman, Ms. Smita Jatia, Director, and Mr. Pankaj Jumta, CFO and VP Finance and Accounts for Westlife Development Limited. Please note that our financial results the presentation had been mailed across to you and these are available on our website as well. I hope you had the opportunity to browse through the highlights of the performance. We shall commence today's call with key thoughts from Amit, who will provide a strategic overview, which shall be followed by Smith through the key business initiatives with overall operational progress, the impact and response during the second wave, and the strategic imperatives that Pankaj will cover analysis of the financial performance and highlights during the review period. At the end of the management discussion, we will have a Q&A session. A request to all the participants that due to the current situation, due to the current uncertainties, members of the management are joining the call remotely and there could be some time lag when responding to your queries. I urge you, therefore, to kindly bear with us. Before we start, I would like to remind you that some of the statements made or discussed on this call today may be forward-looking in nature and must be viewed in conjunction with the risks and uncertainties we face. A detailed statement and explanation of these risks is available in this quarter's press release, investor presentations, and in our annual report, which is available on our website. The company does not undertake to update these forward-looking statements publicly. With that said, I would now like to turn over the call to Amit to share his views. Thank you, and over to you, Amit. Uh, thank you, Devanshi. Uh, good evening, everybody, and hope you and your families are doing well. I'm happy to share that the business is firmly back on track. Revenues are building strongly. Brand trust is rising consistently. And our convenience channels are accelerating at an unprecedented pace. These are the building blocks for brand McDonald's and have firmly entrenched us in the marketplace. We are excited to chart the next phase of growth as we all learn to live with the challenges of COVID-19. QSR, by definition, is driven by impulse and convenience. As consumers discovered new ways and means to experience the brand, our convenience channels have accelerated. Based on our experience of the last 18 months, these positive changes are here to stay. This is very strongly reflected in our recent results. Even with severe restrictions on in-store dining, our sales in July 2021 were almost the same as July 2019 pre-COVID. Additionally, there are some positive tailwinds for the category towards the organized sector. Consumers are increasingly choosing trusted brands with high standards of health and hygiene, which puts us in a strong position. The future lies in being an omni-channel brand that's available whenever, wherever, and however the consumer likes. In the last few years, we at Westlife have invested substantially in our digital capabilities that have been pivotal to our off-premise business growing leaps and bounds in a sustained manner. We are also focused on building a realistic competitive advantage by understanding site-by-site -site performance through extensive research. We have taken the time during the pandemic to reorient the portfolio and are using GIS tools to identify large growth opportunities for the brand. We will continue to grow in our core cities and also expand our footprint in tier two towns that have presented a significant opportunity for growth. Finally, our menu continues to be an important lever for the brand. As you, as you are aware, last year we launched our fried chicken product. This has further accelerated our journey of chicken leadership. We believe this product has the potential to add about rupees 50 lakhs per store per annum and also strengthen our meal proposition. Globally, McDonald's Corporation has the highest average volume across 30,000 plus stores, led by servicing all day parts and menu segments, and we hope to tread a similar path. We believe we are firing on all cylinders, including brand, cost, menu, and access. With this, we are confident of charting accelerated growth and creating new benchmarks for the industry in the coming quarters. I now hand over to Smita, to take you through the highlights of quarter one FY22.
thank you, Amit, and good evening, everyone. I hope all of you and your loved ones are safe and healthy. I am happy to share that business has bounced back strongly. Our strategies of survival and revival have helped us develop a definitive playbook that has been our business resilient to external environment to a large extent. This is strongly reflected in our results. Despite all challenges due to wave two, we saw more than 176% growth across revenues and SSG. Our business continued to hold strong, uh, our business continued to hold strong notwithstanding the lockdown. Our new cost structure and robust revenue recovery have been pivotal to our performance with convenience channels creating new benchmarks. Revenues from our convenience channels have been consistently rising over the last one year. In the quarter under uh, review, overall convenience jumped over 300% YNY. This was driven by delivery, drive-through, and on-the-go. Revenues from drive-through, that is our key competitive advantage, grew by 115% YNY and 52% quarter-on-quarter. Mug delivery continued to rally and grew close to 200% YNY and 36% quarter-on-quarter. It touched a new high yet again in June 2021. This in spite of dine-in restrictions easing in the month. It has been heartening to see off-premise consumption grow consistently even as restrictions around on-premise have been easing. It is now apparent that there is no cannibalization, and this, in fact, is incremental revenue driven by new habits, new customers, and new brand use cases, adding to our top-line strength. This presents immense growth for us. Consider a simple data point. In July 2019, before COVID, our revenue stood at 130 crores, where 70% was through dine-in and only 30% through our convenience channels. Now fast forward to July, our revenues are close to 90% of July 19, even with continued dine-in restrictions. In fact, we have seen 100% recovery in all markets outside Maharashtra that continued to be under strict COVID restrictions even in July. The interesting thing to note is that 62% of this is convenience-led. Even as malls continue to remain muted, drive through and high streets have completely recovered. This makes us believe that when all fam formats are opened, we will be pegged for accelerated growth. With this strong foundation, we will face ahead with confidence in the coming quarter with our key levers of menu and product leadership, accelerating the omni-channel and digital presence, and finally, network expansion and reinvestment to keep the brand model. In order to dominate the snacking and meal occasion this quarter, we launched some very powerful campaigns including the BTS meal that got unprecedented response from our customers. We also hoped in Rashmika Mandana, a popular film star, as a brand ambassador in the South to build stronger brand resonance. With a compelling proposition, we are ready to dominate the 5,000 crore fried chicken market. Technology and digital acceleration continue to be the cornerstone of our strategy. We have been leveraging technology to offer enhanced customer experience. Our digital channels are continuing to outperform despite dine-in restrictions easing up. We are building digital sales in-store also by leveraging our McDonald's app a unique offer engine that provides personalized offers. 
the app has over 5 million total number of downloads a 45% jump year on year in the quarter under review our total guest counts on our app tripled by on by reflecting enhanced customer experience and value and finally on the network we continue to invest in the business by both reimagining our existing stores as well as opening new ones we have added seven mug cafes and 11 experience of the future restaurants in the quarter in fact we had five new stores ready to open during the quarter of which we have already opened two in july and many other are under ground break we are also expanding our network in non call and emerging cities we are guided by a commitment to scale for good and have taken and have been taking definitive steps to positively impact the environment and society that we operate in over the last years we have gone through various esg led initiatives not only reduced our carbon footprint landfill and energy waste but also enhanced operating efficiencies and saved costs this includes usage of energy management systems production of biodiesel from used cooking oils and eliminating of single use customer facing plastic as a direct impact of these initiatives in the last financial year alone we have saved close to 7500 tons of carbon emission through our proactive steps which is equivalent to planting close to 350000 trees <coughs> we have also been working towards fostering inclusion across all our brand touch points i am happy to share that eat equal our campaign around special packaging for our customers with limited upper hand mobility has bagged several recognition and last but not the least we have concluded the first round of vaccination for all our employees while over 1000 have been fully vaccinated we have also announced a comprehensive covid support program to ensure physical and emotional well-being of our employees with this i now hand over to pankaj who will take you through the highlights of our financial performance thank you smita good evening all I hope you and your loved ones are keeping safe. We have entered FY22 on a firmer footing. Our sales have been a whopping 176% growth on a YOI basis, amounting to 259.2 crores. The same store sales growth has jumped 183% on a YOI basis. This is on back of the historical highs made by our delivery and other convenience channels. Let me share some key highlights with you. Our convenience channels that includes delivery, drive-through, and on-the-go consolidatedly grew by 202%, of which delivery grew by 200% and 36% on quarter-on-quarter basis. June 21 was a solstice for us, and we witnessed the highest ever sales in delivery. Drive-throughs have grown by 115% YOY and 52% on quarter-on-quarter basis. Even on the go, has been consistently growing at a robust pace. We saw a steady build-up in the in-store business, and July has been even a stronger uptick. In fact, as I said earlier, we are happy to share that in July we have seen 100% recovery in all the markets outside of Maharashtra. and 100% recovery in all drive through and high street stores this means convenience is here to stay and with the steady build up of dine in volumes we will chart accelerated growth in the coming quarters we have complemented our revenue growth with continued cost leadership we have maximized our supply chain efficiencies continue to rationalize food cost as a result we have maintained a 65.4% during this quarter representing a 218% growth over the last year we continue to target meaningful margin expansion and are tracking towards our long term margin objectives the 
demonstrating our ability to accelerate value regardless of the environment. We have a revised cost structure in place and are continuously improving our operational efficiency. As a result, we have seen a 204% improvement in our restaurant operating margins that stood at 9.8% for the quarter and our operating EBITDA stood at 2%, which represents a 112% improvement over the same quarter last year. What I would also like to highlight is that with the recovery of volumes in the month of June, our restaurant operating margin zoomed to 16% for the month and consequently operating EBITDA jumped to 9.2%. And hence, we believe that with the volume recovery gaining pace, we are heading for strong and sustainable margin expansions. Throughout the pandemic, we kept a razor sharp focus on maintaining a stronger balance sheet and robust liquidity position by optimizing our treasury and working capital. FY22 has and we are confident that we will only accelerate from here on. Our relentless focus on internal improvement and driving synergies across our portfolio will help us extend our continued best-in-class track record. As we go ahead, our priorities are clear, growing our footprint, accelerating our convenience channels, and maintaining fiscal discipline. We are in a strong fiscal position to deploy our capital for business expansion. The pandemic has shown some real, good real estate opportunities for us. And like Amit said, we see a great potential in the tier two cities that have shown greater resilience. We will increase our presence in these cities over the next few years in addition to the metros. With this, I will now hand it back to Amit to take you through the outlook for the coming quarter. Thank you. Thank you, Pankaj. Volatility, volatility is the order of the day, but with our strategic framework, we believe we are very well positioned to navigate through these challenges and continue growing market share. We will continue to make big, bold moves and keep pushing the envelope on innovation and customer experience, thereby making the brand a true millennial brand. With business back on track, we will pick up our pre-COVID pace of re-imaging restaurants and expanding network. While we continue our strong focus on our six key markets, our network in tier two towns are consistently growing, opening up huge opportunities for us, which we will effectively tap into. We will also continue to make significant investments in strengthening our technology backbone, which we believe will be a key business driver from here on. With this, we are confident about our continued market leadership on the back of brand equity, menu innovation, cost leadership, and technology. I now open up the call for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Anyone who would like to ask a question, please press star and one at this time. The first question is from the line of Avi Mehta from Aquiry. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Amit and team. Thanks again for the opportunity. Uh... I just wanted to start with, uh, you know, your comment on the convenience bit. I mean, it seems uh, convenience is a new normal. Given that is the expectation, could you share uh, if you are exploring any change in the store edition or store format to suit that uh, demand more? And uh, could you share the guidance what we should kind of build in for the year forward? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ali. Um, basically, in terms of the store format, first, we have been consistently and continuously sort of incorporating the fact that there's more and more external business. Uh, hmm. Many, many years ago, we had adapted for takeaway. So we have two windows just like a drive through uh, We have consistently improved our drive through ability so that we can push more cars through the window. And as delivery business kept picking up, we wanted to ensure that delivery riders are not consistently coming in and uh, crowding around the front counter, which impacts customer experience. 
So that kind of work we've already done. Uh, yeah, I, I think the key question everybody does ask is about store size. And yeah. uh, like I mentioned before, uh, you know, I don't see us reducing the size at this point in time. My point is that, you know, we obviously want to take our average unit volume per annum. We still want to grow that by 50 to 100 percent over the next five to 10 years. And I feel that even if in-store remains 30 to 40 percent of the business, it's going to be a much larger business size to start with per restaurant. And therefore, while we, even globally we are thinking and talking about it, but there is no immediate shift in the size of the store format at this point in time. In terms of store addition, um, you know, we, I think uh, for us, real estate competitive advantage is very important. It has played out very well. I mean, we can see the fact that we have drive throughs and the fact that we were very well penetrated in the retail locations rather than being only mall dependent has worked extremely well for us. Uh, however, we do believe that um, we are seeing a new buzz in tier two cities. We think it is here to stay. And we believe that therefore from the 25 to 30 store openings that we are doing, uh, we've had a complete relook at the whole market over the last 18 months. Uh, we've used GIS software. We've used a lot of research uh, that we've been doing on side-by-side -side performance. And we believe that the potential overall in our territory is about 1,000 restaurants. And however, it's got to be mined in an intelligent manner. So we are hoping to be able to push the envelope to between 30 and 40 in the coming years and, uh, and therefore accelerate our pace of opening as we go along. We do believe that there is an opportunity in the organized sector now, uh, which has sort of accelerated over the past. Okay, okay. Where are coming from, as you rightly kind of alluded, it was essentially on the store size and, you know, if that reduction can drive a ability to kind of add it at a faster pace, that is what I was trying to understand. But I got a sense that you're looking right now at 25, but this is under discussion. The second yeah, so bit... Uh, Abhi, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you. You see, my point is we have seen enough global markets um, where we've gone with smaller sizes, and then it comes to bite you after 10 years. And you know, the one thing that you cannot change is the size of the store. You can change the decor, you can change the layout, but the size of store is not in your circle of influence. Um, even earlier, over the 25 years, we've experimented with everything. And the, prop the thing is that size is not just saving a little bit on the rent, takes away from our ability to get to, say, 8 crores or 10 crores per restaurant per year. So I I'm sorry, I just wanted to add that. No, no, that's, that's very helpful. That's very clear, Amit. The second bit I wanted to uh, ask is on the guidance for the bidda margin, which we had kind of earlier called out. Uh, you know, mid-teens to uh, mid-teens number is what we were kind of planning, but that was a pre-NDS number. Now, while you've given a conciliation, I I realized that you have not given the NDS adjusted financials the way you were giving last quarter. So would you be able to kind of give us an updated guidance on margin on a reported basis, or could you guide us how should we look at from an FI20, uh, from a 23-24 perspective? Okay, that's an excellent question, uh, Avi. So we maintain, so for example, if I were to take just June sales, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, because it's been so volatile and uncertain, I think June, even though there were too many COVID restrictions, uh, still is a more stable month. So for example, in June, even with all the restrictions, our sales were more than November 2020, which was a Diwali month, and by then restrictions had kind of reduced a lot. So firstly, that was very heartening to see in terms of sales. In terms of margin, uh, you know, let's forget about uh, uh, India's, but restaurant operating margin in June as a month was 16%. You know, so very, very solid, even though sales were still much lower than what they should be normally. So um, we still maintain our guidance that we will be, as per the old accounting standards, we will be at the uh, mid-teens, uh, low to mid-teens uh, in EBITDA margin. Uh, by 2023, the FI 2023 is what we had talked about. So we can still feel that we will get there. And what we will do is we move towards what the industry is doing, the rest of uh, all our QSR peers, where we are just going with the accounting standard. But we will try and add in our MIS uh, some sort of a reconciliation so that you can refer back to uh, to the pre uh, India as well. So, uh, Amit, just a request, if I may, uh, you know, the slide that is there in the presentation, which gives the India's uh, adjustments, if you could continue with that, that would be extremely helpful to help us 
appreciate how that how we are kind of on that path. Uh, that was the only request. Uh, Noted. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Gaurav Jagani from Access Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, sir, and congratulations on a good set of numbers in a uh, COVID-impacted quarter. Uh, so my question is with regards to the other expenses, uh, specifically the D&D expenses. And if you see, uh, while, you know, the sales at UOQ have declined, uh, but, you know, they, uh, the uh, occupancy and other expenses haven't declined much. So is there some one-off there that you would like to call out there? See, I mean, you've got to understand that it's a very volatile, uncertain quarter. And, you know, there are uh, uh, restaurants where we have fixed rentals. There are restaurants where it's revenue share. And, you know, all the landlords, because this came up quite suddenly, right, was, we were not able to get everything at that time. So I personally feel that it's not the right quarter to judge that. I think what is important is if you look at last year, uh, uh, quarter, the mar quarter ended March 2021, versus that if you look at GNA, I think, you know, we've done quite well, uh, even – even though this time around there were no salary cuts, no deferments, nothing like that. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but I personally feel it's not the right comparison given so much uncertainty, what was on, what was not on. Some landlords have supported, some have not supported. So looking at it as a percentage of this quarter may not be the right. <laughs> uh, sure, sir. Well, I get you. You know, I mean, that the percentage of sales would not be the right metric there. Yeah. Uh, my question was largely on the absolute number, but I get your sense that uh, this might, uh, as you get more concessions, maybe I had, this might come down. Uh, will that be right understanding in that sense? Yes, as a percentage, it will come down because yeah. sales uh, already, for example, in July have continued to grow. And uh, with the announcement of Maharashtra that from 15th August, they are going to permit in-store, I think that uh, is going to help us dramatically. Uh, you have to understand that each market, which was very volatile, sometimes on, sometimes off, sometimes shut down on weekends, which is the core part of our business. So, you know, it becomes very difficult to negotiate with landlords accordingly, and that too in a short space, space of time. Sure, so got it. Uh, and so the next question is with regards to the store opening guidance. I mean, uh, this time you specifically alluded to, you know, all these stores opening in the tier two cities, where you are seeing great opportunity, and also uh, you alluded that uh, you would be now looking to 30 to 40 stores uh, per year. So is that uh, you are upping the guidance in terms of the store opening from the 25 to 30 earlier that you were in this study? Yes, absolutely. We do believe so. I mean, we've used this pandemic to really look at the portfolio. And when we look at the portfolio, it is based on facts and data. And this data, you know, cannot be collected sort of in a year. So when you look at Mumbai, we have 100 restaurants in Mumbai. 100 restaurants is very, very, very strong penetration. So if I further go into a mini market of Andheri, you know, there are, say, eight restaurants in Andheri. Now, when you put the ninth restaurant, if you don't know where customers are coming from and where they are going, you tend to can, uh, cannibalize into other restaurants. So with all this work that we have done, uh, we have found that there is, uh, you know, yet pretty much gap in every market. Uh, also, with what's happened, a number of restaurants have sort of shut down as well. There's a shift towards organized. Uh, the delivery business has sort of increased. More recently, our chicken launch has made ourselves more relevant in certain markets in South India as well. And looking at all of that, and especially Tier 2 as well, where I've been very selective in the past, uh, you know, we've sort of upped our guidance around that. Sure, that's great. Uh, so just a follow-up to this, would, so would there be any change to your KPIX guidance? And if you can guide us anything on that? Uh, given the fact that you have also highlighted that you will be investing more on the tech front as well. So what would be the KPEX uh, roughly for this year and the next year if you can help us out? And that would We've be for me. We've been in the 100, 150 crore range. Um, again, this year, because we lost the first quarter in openings, we yet believe we should be in the 20 to 25 range. Um, we are going to push ourselves as hard as we can over the rest of the quarter, three quarters, and then if there's a third wave and again construction stops, then it is what it is. But we are pushing for between 20 to 25. Uh, now, if it is 20, 25, you know that we spend roughly 2.5 to 3 crores per restaurant. So, you know, you can do the math accordingly. Uh, if you are able to get between 30 and 40, it's still over the 100 and it's still, I would say, 120 crores. Uh, plus, if you take everything else, it will not exceed 150 crores. So the 100, 150 crore guidance stays. 
cover for that space. Thank you, and that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone who would like to ask a question, you may press star and one. The next question is from the line of Percy Pantaki from IIFL. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, uh, the fried chicken uh, uh, launch that you have, and uh, you mentioned that uh, you think you can garner about uh, 50 crore per, uh, sorry, 50 lakh per store uh, from fried chicken. So, is this 50 lakh uh, incremental, or uh, uh, I mean, 50 lakhs is from uh, fried chicken, but of course, uh, uh, it would cannibalize some part of uh, the other menu. So, just wanted to understand in light of this. Uh, how much if, let's say, there is a complete normalcy from the COVID front, uh, uh, FI23, what would be your uh, sales per store kind of a target? Yeah, so it's a good question. I'm talking of incremental sales, um, not cannibalized sales. Um, that is part number one. Part number two, we've always maintained that our average unit volume target was to first achieve between six to six and a half crores. Um, so we were at five and a half crores pre-COVID, and the target was to get to between six, six and a half. Uh, in our investor day in 2018, we had given three levers, which was delivery, uh, McCafe, and menu. Uh, delivery has way outperformed, and I think it's here to stay. Uh, and that alone, this is the important part, what I'm going to tell you, that the incremental business of convenience that we've got between delivery, uh, on the go, takeaway, and drive through Right. Even if in-store comes back to 80% of what it was, that's a 10% same-store sales growth. So I'm expecting at least another 50 lakhs per restaurant per year to come out of that. And, the, and chicken, I gave you an indication. So it means almost a one crore, which kind of takes us to the six, six and a half crore per restaurant target that we have talked about for our vision 2023. Okay, so uh, this six to six and a half crore is for uh, fiscal 23 itself, right? FY23 is year. our vision, vision, that was our vision. Obviously, some part of it depends on normalization of COVID. But uh, so in a completely normal COVID scenario, would you yeah, say that yes. FY23 can achieve this target? I mean, anywhere between six, six and a half, yes. Okay, okay, understood, understood. Uh, and uh, secondly, I wanted to understand uh, in terms of menu innovation, you have done this uh, uh, fried chicken and you've done several other uh, menu innovations also in the last uh, uh, two to three years. So would you say that, see, of course, this is a, a continuous process and it will continue even 10 years down the line. But would you say that uh, uh, the main gaps in the portfolio are now uh, sort of plugged and uh, uh, incremental menu innovation is not going to be as big bang as uh, what it was uh, uh, earlier? I feel thankfully we that's not the case. I think even if you look at global McDonald's after operating for 70 years, still menu plays a significant role in the way we are able to grow our business. Even after 70 years, McDonald's globally continues to deliver same-store sales growth, and the average unit volume, even after 70 years, even in very, very developed market, continues to grow. Um, and therefore, I believe that menu innovation just does not stop. Uh, we've also just touched the tip of an iceberg on so many categories. More recently, we launched our gourmet burgers. The response for the gourmet burgers has been absolutely tremendous, and, and yet we haven't even marketed it completely. Uh, it's only available on delivery, but wherever we've launched it, the incremental volume per restaurant has been very, very nice. So, um, so all I can say is menu innovation, even 10 years from now, will continue to be as robust as you see it today. Uh, in the food business, it never stops. Uh, right, sir. That's all for me. Thanks and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kapil Jagasya from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you for the opportunity, sir. Uh, uh, decent set of numbers. Uh, but if I heard it right, uh, you have uh, researched for you know opening around a uh, thousand restaurants. So uh, if we even if we go by the increased uh, 
गाइडेंस ऑफ ओपनिंग थर्टी टू फोर्टी स्टोर सो दीज थाउजेंड रेस्टोरेंट्स वुड बी फुलफिल्ड इन दैट लाइक हाउ मच टाइम लाइक वी का राइट नाउट थ्री हंड्रेड फाइव स्टोर और सो सो दैट वुड टेक अ ट्रिमेंडस अमाउंट ऑफ टाइम Yeah, so the answer to that is that there is an absorption rate factor there as well. So while there is thousand restaurant possible, so I'll give you an example of you take Ahmedabad, take Pune, take Bombay, any of these markets. You know we've been around for a while. So let's say I'm just making up the numbers to make my point. So don't go by the numbers themselves. But you take Ahmedabad, right? We have 20 restaurants, 25 maybe. I think uh, basically we own that market. Can Ahmedabad not be 35 to 40 restaurants over the next five to ten years? Absolutely, it can be. But can I open all of the ten together tomorrow? Absolutely not. So what happens is there's an absorption rate, frequency of eating out continues to rise, brand relevance rises for the consumer in that market for our brand. So all of these factors are there. Um, so basically, even though the gap is there, again Mumbai. While let's say we can do 200 restaurants in Mumbai. But I cannot. Even if real estate was available, I cannot snap my finger and open hundred uh, tomorrow. Uh, an example is you take Andheri, right? So let's say we have eight eight restaurants in Andheri. We started with one, then we put two. But if we could have, if we would have put all eight together, yeah, it would have take a lot of money would have been lost, and we would not have got the average unit volume, and we would have had to shut down. So, um, so there is an art and a bit of science in this, and based on whatever our knowledge is, that is the potential. I, uh, earlier many many years ago uh, in one of our investor calls we had talked about 800 restaurants and i had said how the 800 restaurant changes 800 restaurants become 1000 because of per capita income growth it becomes on real estate growth it grows based on relevance of brand frequency of eating out uh, purchasing power and all of these so there are many many factors involved with that i hope i'm able to explain what i what, what, uh, to to i hope i'm able to answer your question Definitely, definitely. Uh, that was very helpful. And uh, just one bookkeeping question from my side. Uh, other income has dropped on a uh, buy over basis. So would it be because of uh, securing lower rent rental there was this quarter? No, uh, Pankaj will have to answer that. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so going forward, uh, we should be modeling uh, this number uh, for the rest of the year. Yeah. So as we uh, were saying earlier, uh, we will keep on sharing the indels and uh, and the adjusted numbers uh, so that you can get a visibility on a quarter on quarter basis. Okay. Great. That was very helpful. Thank you for asking all the questions. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Jay Kumar Doshi from Kotak. Please go ahead. Hi. Thanks for the opportunity. uh i want to know what are your thoughts on uh, delco format uh, so i got your you know i understood your uh, you know we understand your viewpoint uh, in response to the question i we asked earlier but today when you open large stores uh, you know you can't cover the entire city uh, very well from a delivery opportunity perspective so as a consumer there are you know pockets in the city where a uh, delivery from mcdonald can take maybe 25 30 minutes Uh, which if it cut down to 15 20 minutes you will be able to capture a, a larger pie of the market so what is your thought on attempting or trying out with pure delco stores and you know some of your peers are planning to do so or already started to do so and what will be the uh, case if you were to open you know from a return uh, ratio perspective is it viable or do you, you think it's not viable economically sure um yeah thank you for the question you know it's not that we've not tried or attempted or thought about delcos i go back to my old point that i've made many 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 times that mcdonalds is a high volume business com- company and our average unit volume comes from servicing all day parts different menu segments etc etc uh if i would have gone just on penetration alone without considering long term today we would not have been able to bring mac cafe in every single restaurant imagine if you have 1800 square foot restaurants where the kitchen takes a large part of it and you don't have even capacity in the kitchen because the tighter you make it the tighter you know your cold chain and all that starts suffering and and 5 years later you will see problems so we have seen very very difficult real estate markets globally and when we benchmark those markets every time we've gone to penetrate the city with smaller formats yeah it has never panned out 
the telco model has been tried by McDonald's in many markets. Yes, the world keeps changing every day, but even with that, the capex does not drop significantly enough to give us the return that we are looking for. And now coming back to the other aspect, see, with 100 restaurants in Mumbai, I feel we capture pretty much 95% of the city. As we are going to open new stores, the delivery market is going to be incrementally small. And we rather capture that delivery market with the opening of a restaurant because I go back to my thinking, my, my point I always make is 1 plus 1 plus 1 is equal to 5 is equal to 7. And what I mean by 1 plus 1 plus 1 is that when you have the in-store business, you add to that takeaway, on-the-go, drive-through, wherever possible, and uh, delivery. On top of that, you add McCafe. On top of that, you add breakfast. Yeah, the, the our return as a business is always much better with that. So, I mean, on the call, that's the best I might be able to explain to you. But we've looked at this regularly, and we will continue to look at it. So the answer, the, what I'm saying is it's not that we are ignorant about what a Delco can do or cannot do, but whatever we've seen so far, and even globally, there's a lot of work and discussion around this. But at this point in time, only Delcos look very unlikely, at least for brand McDonald's. Perfect. Now, the idea of asking this question was... Uh, sorry, I'll just also add that we pretty much have 100% coverage of, say, a Mumbai city with the 100 restaurants that we already have. Correct. Huh. So idea was uh, idea of asking the question was on one side you are super bullish on the convenience opportunity and confident that it will continue to stay. So there is a permanent structural change in the consumer habits as far as ordering is in is concerned. And the other side, you know, you are uh, sort of uh, you know relying on the experience of globally of uh, success of Delco based on pre-COVID era where uh, delivery had not taken up. Uh, you know, delivery was not as mainstream as it is today, even in the Western world. So I'm maybe over sorry. the next one or two years, we will get to know where, you know, it settles eventually. But there are enough markets in the world today where delivery, even pre-COVID, was 60% of their business, by the way. And I can, you know, offline tell you which markets they are. So remember, we do over 5 to $10 billion of sales in delivery globally. And, uh, you know, we have almost $100, million, 100 million billion dollars of system-wide sales we have quite a bit of an understanding on how that works. And convenience is not only about delivery, and delivery is no structural change, by the way. It's an incremental use of the customer where they can order outside food at home as well, which in India has grown substantially because of what it is. If you go to Singapore, you go to Indonesia, you go to many of the Middle Eastern markets, 40% of the restaurant business was delivery even pre-COVID. Maybe today that has become 60%. So my point is that, you know, firstly – any brand that lives in the past will not see tomorrow. And if you recollect my comments in the past, you have to keep evolving every day. And we are a brand that is built on evolution and innovation, and we are going to continue to lead that. So, you know, I take your point, and I hope you get my point as well. Definitely, sir. That's uh, very helpful. Second question is, uh, can you talk a little bit about success of MACD in fried chicken globally and uh, any uh, success stories there? And, uh, you know, you Hello. Hello, hello, hello. I've lost you. Mr. Doshi, we have lost the audio from your side. Hello, am I audible? Yes, now, yeah, now audible. Right. Could you talk a little bit about success of MACD and contribution of fried chicken to MACD sales globally? And uh, in uh, you know what is the initial response or that you have seen in the stores where you have launched early on? in terms of uh, average unit volume. And uh, just a final follow-up, this 50 lakh rupee per store, you think that's a potential across your portfolio or that is largely in South and uh, perhaps not so much in uh, Ahmedabad or Mumbai? So firstly, um, uh, you might notice that I'm very cautious with my comments and I only make comments when I firmly believe in what they are. So firstly, globally, McDonald's is very strong in chicken, by the way. And I, I mean, with our $100 billion in sales, we still might be the largest chicken company in the world yet. Um, in, in, in Southeast Asia, we do very strong business, in all of Asia rather, around fried chicken, and particularly Malaysia, Indonesia, and, and many such markets. Uh, we are pretty much uh, number one also in that category. So in India, you know, I have always chosen to go step by step. So even if you look at nuggets, chicken nuggets, 
while globally it's a core McDonald's offering and people swear by our nuggets, but yet we brought uh, chicken nuggets only, you know, in around 2008-2009, almost 10 years after we had opened. So I believe chicken uh, in South India, of course, is a 5,000 crore market. And, uh, you know, we believe that this is now the right time to start playing in it. But I believe that there is similar potential in West as well. Um, actually, in my opinion, it's much more than 50 lakhs. But, you know, I always believe that there is a step-by-step approach. So that's how, you know, we, we think about it. it. It is an all-India opportunity. It's not just limited to South. Although South is slightly more skewed towards chicken. So then South could be, for example, 75 lakhs per restaurant per year. You know, but I'm giving you a bit of an average for our West and South period. Thank you. We lost this line, so we'll move to the next question. Before we take the next question, we would like to remind our participants, you may press star and one to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Amish Agarwal from Prabhudas Niladhar. Please go ahead. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. My first question is on the chicken segment only where uh, uh, I mean, if you are indicating 50 lakhs or maybe going up to 75 lakh sales, uh, if, first of all, how would you compare yourself vis-a-vis, -vis, say, one of your other global competitors like KFC? Because that company is having a run rate of around, say, three and a half crores per store in India, and uh, chicken is their major product. So, uh, how do you look at then your sales in the longer term, or is there a big difference in the product offering or the way you can say KFC as a store is positioned in the mind of consumer. See, this has nothing to do with KFC or anybody else. Chicken is a segment in the country, and I'm only talking of fried chicken. But we have our muck chicken burger, which uh, may in itself do over hundreds of crores of sales. I'm not even talking about that. We have the muck chicken spicy, which, by the way, people swear by and uh, has led to significant increase in our business when we launched it. We have chicken nuggets, we have chicken wings, we have chicken this, and, a, and we have chicken that. Fried chicken was a category we decided to launch only a couple of years ago, and it's not that we did not know uh, what to do with it, because globally we have a pretty strong position in that particular area, but it was just you got to do the right thing at the right time. Uh, and menu and business evolves every day. You know, you don't sort of, you can't put all the thousand products at one shot because consumers also get confused. So in the last two to three years, we've invested in in step-by-step um, -step improving and increasing our chicken menu like we did with burgers. So more recently, we launched our gourmet burgers. Why didn't we do it 20 years ago? Because it is relevant today and it was not relevant 20 years ago. So I feel that it has nothing to do with anybody else. The important thing is that as a protein, yeah, chicken is an important protein. McDonald's has played a significant role from 1996 in this market, and we are continuing to expand this opportunity and continuing towards our chicken leadership. So that is how at least I see it. And like I said, the 50 and 75 lakhs that I'm talking about has to do only with fried chicken. And by the way, irrespective of organized sector, there is a very, very large unorganized sector market of fried chicken that exists particularly in South India and East India. And, uh, you know, we are sort of eyeing that as well, to bring all those customers into the organized sector fold. Okay. So, uh, if I go by what you are saying, uh, then can you share with us that what is the proportion of the non-veg to veg sales in our total food sales uh, as of now? We, we don't generally share the breakup, but um, I mean, just to give you a bit of a sense, it's normally 50 50. Okay, okay. So different markets uh, play a different role, so it's not that easy an answer, but broadly. Okay, okay, that's helpful. Uh, and uh, I mean, my second question is regarding our restaurant operating margin. So, what sort of a number should we look at it in the medium term, say, for if we are looking at, say, one, two years down the line? particularly FY23 and beyond, on a pre-India basis? Yeah, sure. So basically, we've said restaurant operating margin, you know, we define our restaurant operating margin very clearly. 
and quarter and restaurant operating margin doesn't have any play with the NDS 116. So, you know, at least uh, at Westlife, we've been consistent with it from 2013 uh, since, you know, we sort of listed. So on that, uh, on restaurant operating margin, 16 to 18% is really what we are sort of shooting for. And if we are able to get to that 16 to 18 range, we are talking of operating EBITDA between 13 to 15%. So on FY23 onwards, I, I don't give guidance, but I'm saying trend-wise, that's where we are heading. Okay, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vishal Sudmunia from Nirmal Bang in Crystal Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, again, on the margin front or the operating margins for the quarter, uh, if I look at the cost items uh, and if I just compare it with 2Q of 21, where the top line was actually lower than what we did during this particular quarter, I understand that uh, employee costs have slightly gone up as well as rental costs might have also gone up. But is there any other cost that you see for this quarter, which might have uh, not been there uh, at, a, uh, at a significant level in 2Q, 3Q, maybe in the terms of advertisement spends towards this new category or maybe uh, uh, doing some spends behind the stores which are not operational for the quarter, but you might have spent uh, uh, during this particular quarter uh, to open it uh, in the next quarter. Uh, so any, any uh, uh, thoughts on that front? So I'll let Pankaj take that question. But I'll only give you one bit of information that I've sort of gone by. Uh, firstly, the second wave came pretty abruptly and suddenly. Secondly, it was more severe than the first wave. And thirdly, to me, what was important was in June, where still there were very severe restrictions, but our sales were better than November, and our restaurant operating margin was at 16%, and our operating EBITDA was at 10% in that month. And that clearly tells me the cost structure continued to stay where it needed to be. Um, but obviously, there were no employee cutbacks this time. There was no salary impact. In fact, we sort of rewarded our people to work with us through all of last year, which was a very, very difficult year. But Pankaj might give you more specifics uh, if, if he might be able, if he has anything to add. Now, just to add, uh, you know, because of uh, the high volatility in this quarter, uh, so percentage to sales is not the right way to look at it. But if you see the growth of the p line items in operating costs, SGNAs, food costs, etc., they have been significantly lower than the sales growth of 176%, which, which establishes the revised cost structures in place. And as Amit said, with the June recovery, we were already at 16% restaurant operating margin and, and EBITDA touching 10%. Okay. Uh, and secondly, uh, when you talk about the fried chicken market and uh, getting shares from the unorganized market, uh, but what I believe is the unorganized market is uh, purely a fried chicken market and not a, a fried chicken breaded, uh, breaded fried chicken market. So would it be uh, easy to convert those uh, consumers to a breaded fried, con uh, fried chicken market? I mean... From our point of view, we've seen in other markets like Malaysia, et cetera, where it happens over a period of time. So, for example, what happens is, like I, I always say this, and I truly believe, I believe that the more burger players, advertising burgers, talking burgers, and making burgers available increases the penetration of burgers in the country, right? And slowly, I talked about how we will bring new users into the market. Similarly, I do believe that in the fried chicken market, the same thing is going to happen. As more and more people offer it, uh, make it affordable, people do start moving up. And as they move up the value chain, they start then coming towards breaded, etc. cetera. Um, so there are yet many examples of breaded, like if you go to Empire in Bangalore, which is one of the most popular sort of fried chicken markets, it is all coated, right? And the breading quality or type may be different but it is still breaded. And in our case, we have created a unique coating. Uh, it's called the ghost chili uh, coating and consumer sort of uh, feedback even before we launched it. On a scale of 10, it was average nine and a half. 
I mean, below nine, we did not get a single score. And now that is reflected in the sales that we are seeing in the market as after the after sort of this time, because of the pandemic, we could not advertise it. But as people are experimenting it, we are continuously seeing a rise in sales in, in this particular product. So we do believe that we will convert over time, bring new users into the McDonald's fold. And last point I want to make is just like McCafe. Previously, when you wanted to have coffee before McCafe, McDonald's was not in your consideration set to start with. Okay, similarly, if you wanted to go for fried chicken, which has its own set of sort of customers, McDonald's was never in the consideration set. With us having launched, uh, uh, with us having launched the fried chicken, and as the awareness for that increases, as people try the product, yeah, we will come in the consideration set of the consumer. And that alone will give us a certain amount of business. And the rest of it will come through our unorganized and through competition of organized sector. Sure, sure. Understood, understood. Just uh, lastly, uh, uh, in the uh, southern market where the uh, where you obviously uh, uh, started with the fried chicken uh, portfolio, uh, uh, how many dips would a person buy for to uh, basically consume a particular bu- uh, bucket of fried chicken? And what are the margin benefits when you uh, do you see uh, along with the fried chicken when you when they consume the dips? Thank you. So we don't sort of I mean too minor a point to be honest, uh, Vishal. I mean it's not going to change the game substantially. For us right now, it's about people trying the product. The numbers two thing is to bring McDonald's in their consideration set when they think of fried chicken, and it's a step toward what we call chicken leadership. Yeah, that we've been able to achieve in many of the markets. So, um, so that is currently what the focus is. Uh, we don't obviously discuss individual margins, but to me, it's about taking average unit volume up, and that in itself, in our opinion, will lead us to margin growth in terms of operating EBITDA and restaurant operating margin. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Jayesha from OHS Portfolio EP Research. Please go ahead. A good presentation and explanation. I have two important questions. The first one is that when we hear about Jubilant Burger and the others looking at stores expansion of 75 to 100 per annum, Westlife at 25 to 35 range appears pretty modest and makes it look like a defensive stock in a hyper-aggressive sector. Uh, how should we look at it? And what are the constraints that doesn't allow you to grow at this? And do you think these kind of growth rates are sustainable? Because we have seen the large listed player you know, add stores on their base, which is still so high. So in one way, are they taking away the market potential from you and are you feeding potential market share to them? Uh, so we don't believe so. Um, we have seen many, firstly, it's about average unit volume as well. And rather than do 1,000 square foot stores that do 2 crores or 3 crores in average unit volume, just to show that we have 1,000 stores is not our strategy. Uh, we have seen enough very large players, many of whom you are talking about, you know, just announcing that I will do 700 stores, uh, I feel does not change the game. You will see this from this type that we consistently, through the period of 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, where everybody else was shutting stores, but we were adding 25 to 30 stores. And there is an example of some of our competition from whom we've learned. You know, they were at 400 stores in 2014, and they are at 400 stores in 2019. Yeah, maybe today they are at 450 stores. So my point is, you know, just because uh, you are opening 70 restaurants a year is not material. Then let me put it differently. Suppose I can be 10 crores per restaurant, and this course could take me to 3,000 crores right there. So I feel there is a balance between the two, and I think the jury is still out there over time to tell us. We are, it's about market share, finally. It's not about number of stores. And currently in the markets we operate, we lead in market share. It's about penetration. It's about the number of consumers that are using you per store. So, for example, in 100 stores in Mumbai, if I can do average unit volume of 9 crores per store, let's say I'm making this up, the 9 crore means obviously I'm serving a very large base of customers. 
So why should I build 200 stores to serve the same 9 crore average unit volume? You understand what I mean? If the average right. unit volume of the 200 stores is 4.5 crores, why should I put another 200 crores of capex? So please first see the HRPL and Westlife performance over a 10-year horizon in terms of how we've grown our stores and how everybody else has. And I'm not saying they are good or bad. I'm just saying you see the difference. Finally, when you look at 35 stores, the 35 stores or 30 stores is for half the country as well. Okay? So, I mean, you've you got to factor that in as well. So, yeah. I think I've made my point. Just to, okay, just, to add, um, a, just to add, there is a substantial difference in the AUV of McDonald's stores versus competition. So, when we open one store, it is equal to almost two stores. So, it's, it's, you, you can also uh, compare like that. So, it's, it's, it's the national presence and plus the AUV difference. So, globally, then there were at some point more one other brand than McDonald's. Yeah? So, McDonald's had 32,000 restaurants. And that other chain claimed that they had more restaurants than McDonald's. But McDonald's uh, sales were 100 billion or at that time maybe 70 billion. And this other chain was 15 billion, right? And McDonald's made, say, $8 billion in profit. And, you know, the other chain made sort of no profit. So my point is it's not about number of stores. It's about the right quality of stores, the right average volume, the right location, real estate competitive advantage, like how we've got drive throughs it, makes, it has made a significant difference. How we've been able to penetrate high street versus only being in malls, all that matters. Right, right, right. No, got it. That, that's a very useful insight. So uh, just to follow up on this, uh, hypothetically, what will make you look to store expansion up to, say, 50 crores? I mean, what is the constraint here, if at all? the Indian market because one, the frequency of eating out is still the lowest in the world. Number two, the per capita income is lowest in the world. The ability of the consumer to spend money, as you can see in any category, forget USR, is the lowest in the world. But yes, we have population. So you can say we have a billion people and therefore we should have 10,000 restaurants. But I would love to see somebody build 10,000 restaurants. I, I gave the example earlier on the call. That while Ahmedabad, I'm just using these numbers to make my point. The numbers have no relevance. Let's say Ahmedabad right. can take 50 restaurants. And say, by the way, if you show me another brand that has 100 restaurants in Mumbai, yeah, of, of our standing in, in our category, there is nobody that has 100 restaurants in Mumbai. And to make 100 restaurants in Mumbai and make money in the 100 restaurants in Mumbai, I think clearly reflects on what the brand is all about. Of course we have chosen to go on an inside-out strategy. And therefore, as we get into smaller cities, and, and by the way, we are in 40 small cities as well, outside of the six core metros. But we own our six core metros, and that's been our strategy. So my closest competitor in Mumbai would have 30 restaurants. You understand? So right. you've got to look at the quality of real estate. You've got to look at the diversification. But to answer your question, it's about growth in frequency of eating out, it's about the economy growing. Economy can't grow at 4% GDP, and then you expect that, you know, we can grow faster than that. It's tough. For, for us, it's about sustainable growth, yeah? Right. That That's very useful. Uh, and Amit, my second question is that, you know, as shareholders, we have noticed that whenever the Westlife stock crosses 450, there is a little bit of regular promoter selling, which ends up being an over, over high. Now, we have seen the practice, you know, in the other companies where the promoters have given an indication in terms of how much they want to sell for whatever reason and up to what point. Uh, that gives us some kind of visibility as to what, ex what to expect. Can we expect something similar out of you? Absolutely. And we have been saying this in all our calls. So there is a lot of pressure on us to increase liquidity. And every time some very good global investors want to buy, we start getting calls and pressure from a lot of people to help with liquidity of the stock. So we have made a stated goal that we are currently at, I think, about 57% or so. We've said over the next three to five years, we want to come down to about 53%. So, you know, uh, uh, over time in the right manner with the right disclosures, we want to sort of help get the stock to the liquidity that all our peers who recently listed have got. So that's really what it is. And, and we are quite upfront that we want to get to about 
over the next three to five years. Okay. Thank you very much, Amit. That's very good. That's all. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, to get back to the screen, that was the last question. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Amit Jabia for closing comments. No, thank you very much, everybody, for being on the call. Appreciate your questions and patience to hear our answers. Uh, have a lovely weekend and stay safe. And we meet again in the next quarter. Thank you. On behalf of Westlife Development Limited, that concludes the conference call. Thank you for joining us, and you may now.